Well, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to talk a bit more about emotions in prison tonight. And I'm going to start with Sabah Tahir's quotation, which is, your, emo your emotions make you human. Even the unpleasant ones have a purpose, she said. I like this quote for two reasons. The first one is it's kind of a justification or a rationalization for why we should be doing emotions research. We all have them and we're always feeling something. But there's also a challenge here for researchers too. Because if emotions have a purpose, I think it's incumbent on researchers to kind of figure out what that purpose is. And for my ends, that means trying to understand how emotions play into prison life. So in my 30 to 35 minutes, I'm going to try and cover quite a bit of ground. I'm going to do a bit more sort of throat clearing and set the context as to why this study, um, why I came about this study. And then I'll talk about my design. And then I'll spend the bulk of the talk going through some findings. And I'm going to present a framework based on the metaphor of water. And then after that, I'm going to cross the difficult bridge back to theory. And I really like Calvary and Farrell's idea that emotions are not just byproducts of criminality, but are rather they constitute the causal factors that drive and sustain crime. So that's the argument. I mean, they're a bit bolder about making this claim than I'm going to be, but I, I really like what they're, they're hinting upon here. After that, I will talk about a few of the limitations of the study design, and then I'll say a few thank yous to the people that have helped me complete this project. <clears throat> okay, so I think it is fair to say that historically the social sciences have been a bit left-brained, and, and by that I mean they generally privilege the mechanistic, more rule-guided theories over more sort of affective, subjective, and creative approaches. And that, I do think, has got a sort of gender and power base to it as well. So the rationality and reason has been associated uh, with, with men or less. Okay. But thankfully, modern science, and, and almost a bit ironically, it's modern science that's saying that this can all be interwoven. And in fact, you can't make neat distinctions between um, reason, rationality on one side, and emotion on the other. They're sort of inextricably intertwined all the time. But there's another, so for those reasons then, we're kind of shifting forward in time a little bit now to, to say that there's been a bit of an emotional turn. But I'm looking at Alison as well and some of the feedback from my advisor that maybe it's better to talk about an emotional return, that sociology in its initial conception was grounded on a number of texts that were written precisely in reaction to capitalistic systems that sort of denied a role for emotions and affective states. I'm thinking of people like Adam Smith, Karl Marx, George Sibyl, and Max Weber. So to give one example, George Sibyl talks about the de-individualizing tendencies of the metropolis and urban spaces. If I can shift forward now to the prisons context, um, I think it is fair to say that emotions have been quite surprisingly underexplored in general um, over the last sort of 40 or 50 years. And I say surprising because when you go into prisons, you can't help but notice the sort of charge of different zones of the prison. Um, that being said, there's, there's been quite a lot of growing interest in, in issues of embodiment and affect over the last decade or so. For my purposes, I'm going to draw attention to two publications that I found very important. One is Alison's 1999 claim that there was a bit of an over-reliance on clinical instruments to measure things like mood, anxiety, and depression. And what those instruments often missed was the subjective, cognitive, and more affective contributions that prisoners made to their own senses. Another important publication is Cruetal 2014. And what they did in that paper is note two things. There was a narrow, when emotions were mentioned, it was in quite a narrow way. It was often focusing on anger and aggression in men's prisons. But in that paper, they found a much wider range of feelings, what they termed the emotional geography of prison life. So they were sort of important context for my study. OK, so now moving forward a little bit. So the question that interests me particularly is how can emotions help us to understand the prison world? 
And I think a good answer to that question involves different levels of analysis, and perhaps these aren't perfect conceptual divisions. I think you could easily make an argument that there's crossover and overlap between them. But I've looked at emotions at the level of self, um, social emotions existing relationally between people, and also continuing the argument by Ben and colleagues that emotions have spatial determinants too. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on this section. And the guiding research question here is what kinds of emotions do prisoners experience and how are those emotions managed? And as Ben mentioned, I went into two prisons to collect my data, HOP SEND and HOP Ramsey. SEND is a closed category women's prison in Surrey, and Ramsey is a cat team men's prison in Nottinghamshire. I did 50 interviews with 25 men and 25 women, and before the interviews, I shadowed each of the interviewees. I spent about four to eight hours with each individual before the interview to try and get a sense of emotions in situ before doing more traditional sort of narrative interviewing. I introduced this emotion wheel in the interviews to try and simulate discussions of different types of emotion and the various intensities of feelings in different places. Um, I quite like this because it gets more intense as you go to the center and, and, and radiates out and as things become more diffuse. So it's not perfect because there's many different theories of how many emotions we have. Um, but I, I like it because it brought conversations back to discussions of affect. It was a useful crutch to, to bring out in the interviews. Okay, so I'm moving quite quickly, but I want to talk through my findings. So when I gathered my transcripts together and some of the prisoner artwork that I um, collected and was shown by some of the prisoners, this was done by a woman in Send, and she called it Waxed Emotion. So I compared my transcripts with some of the prisoner art and I looked for artwork online. And there's something that struck me that emotions are always sort of flowing, or they've got like a fluid, a fluid sense to them, and they're often colourful, and there's mixing going on. So with those commonalities in mind, what I've tried to do to analyse my data at the individual level is to come up with a, what I'm calling a fluid metaphor. Um, it's a framework for trying to understand the different ways in which prisoners manage their emotions. And there's a bit of logic to this, I hope, um, because at the top of the model, the strategies are more passive and avoidant of emotion. And as you move down, prisoners become more active and engaged at trying to work on those emotions. I'll talk about limitations a bit later, but I think it is quite a rational model in some ways, so that's potentially one drawback. So now what I'm going to do is talk through these in turn. Okay, so I found a lot of emotional suppression, which I call bottling up. Um, now in the broader literature outside of prison, it's supposedly men that do all the suppressing or bottling, because so the sociological argument goes, parents teach their children things like boys don't cry, whereas girls are taught to be keepers of the heart, to keep diaries, to express themselves in emotional language more often. But what I found is that in both of the prisons, there was a large amount of emotional suppression. And I was trying to think through the different reasons why that might be. And I think one of the reasons is that they're sort of a product of prisoner norms. So this is quite common in the masculinity in prison literature to hear things like do your own time. And that showing emotion is somehow equated to weakness and risks of exploitation. But I found similar narratives in the women's prisons too. So Rebecca says, and all the names I should say are pseudonyms, um, Rebecca <laughs> says, people will kick you when you're down. If you show your emotions, people will think you're weak. Then people start bullying you and taking liberties, says Pia. I think one tentative con conclusion you can draw then is that masking emotion, emotion is not just the product of prisoner masculinities. So it might also be a product of the institutional management of emotion. So when prisoners were placed on uh, ACT documents, which is a, a document about uh, concerning risk of harm, uh, self-harm rather, and suicide, 
Prisoners had protections that were being spotlighted rather than supported. They felt pathologized rather than receiving genuine therapeutic support. There was also concern that seeking out help would linger on one's parole record. Danielle says they think you can't cope and that by showing emotions, you're not going to be able to cope out there. But people out there cry, people out there show emotions, but in prison you seem not to be allowed to. And I've tried to draw a connection with some of Ben's work, um, arguing that the suppression of emotion is connected to the concept <coughs> of tightness and psychological kind of coercion. But positive states also had to be suppressed too. So joy and happiness was often penalised. Zoe says when she was dancing around, letting other people listen to music, the next day she found she was doing a mandatory drug test. <laughs> Similarly, Carl says you can't be happy in here, you can't be shining. Um, so not only could it lead to more drugs tests, but also an increased frequency of cell searches and frisks and pat downs. So too much positive emotion as well could catch the sort of institutional gaze. Okay, so on to part two. Um, I'm arguing that part one and part two are quite closely connected, so suppressing feelings and pushing them down seem to be very closely related to a subsequent loss of control over emotions, as seen through outbursts of violence and verbal aggression. I call this a kind of boomerang effect. This accords with some of the health psychology literature, such as Hawkins 20, um, 2013, who talks about how unprocessed emotions resurface in the body's endocrine and nervous system. I'm a big fan too of Gabor Mate, who says that suppression and discharge are inseparable processes, but their common root is the buildup of physiological stress. And this seems as good a time as any to um, plug both of their books. Um, I really like the way they look at the sort of less than conscious ways in which we hold things in the body. Um, Basil van der Kolk's Body Keeps the Score and uh, Gabor Mate's When the Body Says No. This connection between one and two was made quite nicely by one of the participants, Catherine, who said that in this piece of artwork that she drew for the interview, a sort of a preparation for the interview, um, you've got the person drowning up to their mouth with emotions and feelings, and then it's blowing up and it's all seeping out into the water. And so and she argued, you know, in prison you've got so much emotion trapped inside with few sort of escape valves. And in a shameless plug for a recent article I've had published, <laughs> um, I've tried to capture these two parts, one and two. The, the pushing down and then the sort of exploding back out. But one thing I haven't said yet that I do talk about quite a lot in that article is the biographical depth and painful life histories of my participants that seem to be perpetuated and playing out again in the prison environment. Okay, I hope my water metaphor isn't getting too tenuous, but I'm on to part three, which is diluting. And what I'm getting at here is the way in which prisoners seem to be trying to sidestep around certain strong emotions, rather than confronting them head on. So I still think this was a relatively passive strategy, um, diverting often through abuse of a routine, but it helped them resolve the emotional intensity of their troubled feelings and habits. So for example, Paula says, the way I managed my emotions from day dot was to be proactive and be busy. And similarly, Alan talks about kind of you know, taming time through breaking it up into little sections. So doing the, the sentence in parts. Kyle sort of evinced a kind of bounded agency and it was clear that his routine gave him a sense of where he was going to be, where he needed to be, and that he felt ready. I've highlighted what he says here as, I'm not rushing, as quite important because it suggests that the routine gave a sense of peace or at least order to one's day. What Ian O'Donnell has called a skeleton to support each day. I found it a bit ironic too that prisoners who had the busiest routine and that were most engaged with the regime i.e. they got involved with programs, work, education, and physical exercise, felt the most free from institutional grip. Having a good routine in place 
in place help prisoners to avoid exotic but riskier forms of diversion, such as drugs. Um, Elliot argued that it was boredom that drove you towards taking drugs, and that if you've got other things to occupy your mind, then you don't need them. To bring this part together, I think that diluting was semi-successful for the prisoners that used it, but it had to be a perpetual project. Perpetual because it was always avoiding the root emotion, and therefore it was quite vulnerable to regime changes or changes in the timetable, staff shortages in prisoner and freezes to prisoner movement. Okay, number four, distilling. So I'm evoking the term distilling as kind of trying to extract the essential meaning of something, and, and, and that meaning being the emotion here. Um, there's a bit of a concordance with Cohen and Taylor's argument that the first rule of any handbook of survival is to understand what's happening to you. So it's becoming a bit more, I hesitate to use the word agentic, but it, it's becoming a bit more sort of, engage, there's more engagement now with prisoners and working on the emotions at, at this stage. So Billy had quite an astute understanding of how his emotions work. He said he was able to identify them. I know how I work and I know how I feel. He noted his physical sensations. If I'm embarrassed, I feel myself getting hot. And he was also able to locate the positions in his body where he felt the emotions. So he said anger and he points to his stomach. In a relatable manner, Janice evinced the kind of therapeutic empowerment in her language. So she'd been through the therapeutic um, environment in SEND, um, and she said, I do an inventory on myself every night, so I can look underneath at what's really going on. If I've got a resentment through the day, I look at why I'm resentful, and what's the fear underneath it. Other ways of distilling included letter writing. It was kind of an externalization process even if the letters didn't get posted. Molly says that as soon as something bad happens, I put it on paper, and once I read it back, I can see it in a different light. Artwork formed a similar sort of outlet for Danielle, and it's interesting that Danielle talks about artwork as her heartbeat. This kind of recalls earlier to what <coughs> I was saying about embodiment, and that if, if in parts one and two, prisoners weren't aware what was going on in their bodies, at this point, there seems to be some sort of connection, even if it's a bit more metaphorical. So overall, in the distilling stage, I think it offers an empowering and stabilizing activity for prisoners, helping them to understand and accept their internal states a bit better. It helps them garner perspectives on their emotions, rather than feeling completely at their mercy. Okay. The final part of my framework I've called alchemy, and I'm, I'm using this term as a way to sort of understand, uh, following the, the cultural literacy definition here, a way of transforming one chem chemical element into another. This was creative and generative. It, it, it involved a direct engagement with affected states um, to try and completely alter their impact and their intensity. In, in other aspects of psychological literature, this has been called emotional re reappraisal or cognitive reframing. So one example of alchemy, then, is the way in which prisoners, or some prisoners at least, invoke spiritual philosophies to make sense of their sentence. Alan talked about trying to see the sense in the grand scheme of things. And Olivia mentioned that you know, if you can find a spiritual resolution, if you can see something bigger in all of this, it helps you get through. Similarly, Paula invoked fate. I try to tell myself that the sequence of events inevitably has to happen. In, in these narratives, hitting rock bottom was sort of recast as the solid foundation on which one could rebuild. Out of the tragedy has come something good, says Ellie. <laughs> Sometimes it was the sentence that was appealed to, and other times it was family. So Mikey says, my kids need me and I need my kids. Something greater was being appealed to. At this stage, the reappraisal strategies were sort of replacing anxiety and fear with other feelings like comfort and serenity. And in that way, they functioned like a sort of psychological escape route. In the last piece of prisoner artwork I'm going to show you, this was also by a woman prisoner in Send. 
she had a whole sequence of these different images, uh, all of her being like the phoenix rising from the ashes, perhaps a bit of, tr of a trope of uh, prison art classrooms, but um, on some of the images, her face was grimacing, and she said, you know, I really had to burn before I could feel that I, I, I'd reinvented myself. And I think there's some uh, accordance here with Joseph Campbell's idea of the hero's journey, that you have to go down into some kind of abyss before you can transform and atone. Okay, so that was quite a whistle-stop tour through the model. Now I'm going to try the more difficult job of bringing this back to theoretical uh, concerns. And, and one way I'm going to suggest that we could do that is think about how those management strategies might be placed into different groups and what might that say? Because otherwise it's just a descriptive exercise. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I like Calvary and Jerome's quite, um, yeah, quite interesting idea that emotions are causal factors that help drive behavior. And so they studied the resistance pro uh, process and broke it into different stages. And I'm going to follow that a little bit, but say that different patterns of emotional management hint at different kinds of directions in development to and potentially away from the client as well. So if I can just show you the model one more time. Um, I'm, I'm open to suggestions for better names for these two categories, better names than rigid and flexible, but I, I'm going to stick with this for now. And that the rigid category involved a group of prisoners that relied much more on the first three parts of the framework. Whereas the second, more flexible group drew on the more active and engaged approaches. So, so if we look at the rigid group, they were either too passive, they seemed caught in the waves of their emotions and feeling states, or on the other hand, they were slightly too controlling. They had very absolute stances about how things should be done. Maybe they had very rigid regimes and routines and that made them particularly vulnerable. And so that connects with Cavalier and Farrell's early stage the sisters group, who showed a narrower, narrower range of emotions. For my purposes, I think I could talk about a smaller toolkit of ways of managing emotions. There's also a connection with Crew et al. 2017. Uh, their long-term prisoners in the early stages of their sentence seemed more like they were treading water being carried by the tide of their sentence or seeking to swim against it. By some contrast, the second group were far more emotionally pliable. They were less avoidant of their feeling, state, feeling states. They had regular routines but were less dependent on them. They were often mentors. They often had far more responsibilities and were more stable. This connects with Calvary and Farrell's idea that there's a building bridges phase, which is about trust and care and building social relations. I've thought about using this as a way of politely challenging social bonds theory, which I think quite rightly says that it's important to have social ties, such as relationships, marriages and jobs. But they don't always say that how that process actually happens, how somebody goes into getting to a marriage or a relationship or, or gets the job. Perhaps it's an emotional shift that makes some of these things possible. And another connection with Crew et al. 2017, in their late stage long-term prisoners, they, were, they learned to sort of swim with the tide um, rather than against it, using its energy to their advantage. That, that seemed to apply quite well to this group also. Okay, so I've just got a couple of more things to say and then I'll open it to questions. But I'm trying to think a bit harder about the dialogue between emotions and the sociology of imprisonment literature, the psychology of confinement too. And I've made a suggestion over the last couple of slides that these groups may indicate a kind of emotional maturation process, or at least a coming to awareness about patterns of dealing with emotions, which may say something about when you're ready to change. Emotional management also has something to say about control and order, I think. I haven't presented much data about it here, but when I found um, accounts of anger, it was often to do with the loss of power and a kind of jostling in the social hierarchy of the prison. Perhaps then, looking at through the lens of emotions, 
can allow us to see, look at some of these debates from a different angle. I also like Bartlett's claim in 2001 that it's a motion that helps us link broader social structures to the behavior of individual actors. It acts like a form of connected tissue. I've already mentioned the ways in which, or some of the ways in which institutions, whether consciously or unconsciously, marshal emotions within individuals in different directions, such as through encouraging um, suppression and you know, a, a, a more limited range or repertoire of emotions that can be expressed. I wanted to talk a little bit about things like learning together and the drawings connections work because in a quite different way, I think these programs often provide outlets for processing feelings and I'd be really interested to know more about what the underlying affective states were when some of these groups were going on. Okay, so I'm just rounding off now, but I think it's important to acknowledge some of the limits of my work too. As much as I enjoy a good metaphor, and I think in the PRC we, we, we share that in common, perhaps we can talk about some of the limits of metaphor too. I, I try to take care not to shoehorn my data too much, but I guess that's always a risk when you take on a metaphor. I try to use the data as a guide, and I hope the water imagery wasn't too loose or too abstract. Secondly, I have to be a bit careful about making causal inferences. This was a cross-sectional research design. Um, there is always the possibility that what I think is important um, about emotions may just be another signpost which sort of points you, you know, the finger that points at the moon isn't actually the moon, right? So it, there could be another underlying mechanism going on. Um, as Ben mentioned, I'm going to start my ESRC grant tomorrow to try and explore in further detail how these <coughs> pathways might play out over time with, with a short longitudinal element built in. And when it comes to trying to research emotion, especially in real world settings, there's always measurement problems. I mean, there's many, but just a couple is, is how well do people even know their own emotions? It suggests a quite uh, conscious approach. Um, and how well can people articulate their emotions too? They're, they're just a couple. I think there's a good argument in this field for Holloway and Jefferson's book title for doing qualitative research a bit differently. And I just want to finish by saying a few thank yous. Um, I owe a lot of them, but a massive thank you to my now former supervisor, Ben Crew, for all his help and support. Um, Alison Liebley for everything over the last few years, and I look forward to staying around. And Yvonne Dukes, who was, they were both my PhD examiners. Everyone in the Prisons Research Centre who's helped shape my ideas. My first year reviewers, Susie Holly and Lorraine Gelsthorpe, and the ESRC for funding my research. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>